Hello and welcome to the IdeaCast interview series, episode number 43. My guest in this episode is Dr. Aaron Ahuvia. And Dr. Ahuvia is a professor of marketing at the University of Michigan Dearborn College of Business. And he's the most widely published and cited academic expert on non-interpersonal love. He's also the author of a book called The Things We Love. And we're going to begin the conversation talking about the book, The Things We Love, and we will work on defining non-interpersonal love in this conversation. But we move about quite, uh, quite a bit in the conversation. We cover a range of things that orbit around the idea um, and the thesis in his book. So please join us for this conversation. I thank you very much for you joining us, and I hope you enjoy listening to this conversation as much as uh, we enjoyed having this conversation, and thank you for your company. I'd like to welcome Dr. Aaron Ahuvia to the IdeaCast interview series. And mm-hmm. yes, yes, thank you so much for for coming on and having a conversation uh, with me today. I'm very thrilled to have you on board. Great, it's I, I've been looking forward to it. Awesome, and I'd like to welcome the YouTube audience as well. Thank you guys so much for for being here and uh, being passive uh, attendees in this conversation. Uh, you know, of course, you're welcome to uh, leave comments down below because we might ask, uh, uh, we might solicit some information from you all in this conversation. So uh, feel free to engage in that manner. Uh, so anyway, uh, Dr. Ahubia, um, you have a book. The Love of Things. I want to, first of all, full disclosure to the audience. I've not read the book yet because Aaron and I got together and we had a conversation and we thought, you know, he's an author of a book and we can talk about that. Um, but perhaps in the future, we'll do more of a formal uh, book related conversation. But we're going to start with the book. Uh, and and I would encourage you all to uh, to check into his book and see what you think. And uh, but we'll cover a little bit of that in this yeah. conversation. But then there may be a future date where I'll actually read the book and then I'll have more formal yeah. questions for for Dr. Ahuvia. They're so much more honest than most of my students who just try and bullshit their way right through. <laughs> I, so. I can't do that, man. I've had people say, you know, I ask for review copies and they're like, please don't skim it. And it really helps if you read the book. And, and a couple of people are like, you actually read the book. And I'm like, dude, I cannot come on and have a conversation without no. I just can't do it I can lie I mean I you know I it's the liar's parent like the, the non-liar's parent I will lie you know but usually they're a little white lies but anyway yeah I I owe you that I, I would owe any author that to uh to I would not want to so in other words I put myself in that position there's no way I would feel good having a conversation so anyway let's now having had that disclosure um let's open up and talk about your book for a moment and see where the conversation flows from there sure so the the book um is called the Things We Love, How Our Passions Connect Us and Make Us Who We Are. And it comes out of my research um, where I have taken the psychology of love from human relationships and said, how does this apply when people love objects or activities or places or other things that aren't people? Um, To give like the third and super brief conceptual recap, I've been researching this for about 30 years in different ways. Um, People do really love all sorts of things. Um, The human brain has a limited number of sort of systems built into it for doing that evolved for doing certain things. And now that we live in this complicated consumer culture, we have to take these older neurological systems and apply them in new contexts. So one example that I love is that if you show a person who's really into sports cars, a a nice looking sports car, they'll actually start to salivate. You can, you know, you get literally, they'll they'll start to salivate. And salivating makes a lot of sense if you're gonna eat something, but it doesn't make sense for a sports car. But why are they doing that? Well, you know, they're, they've got, they're, they, as animals, we evolved a system for hunger Right? We didn't evolve a system for wanting sports cars. So our brain is just doing the best it can. <laughs> it's taking the system for hunger and supplying it. Yeah. Right. Until so you get this weird uh, you know, byproduct. Yeah. The, the yeah. same is true for uh when we love things, animals, not humans aren't the only animal that have love. Um lots of animals have things that are close to love, and other mammals do have something that I would call love. Um, if you put them in a uh, fMRI brain scan, 
um, and show them their little animal mates, the same parts of their brain will activate as if you take a human and put them in a brain scan and show them their mate. So okay. it seems pretty straightforward to me to say, yeah, that's, you know, it looks like love on the outside and it looks like love on the inside. Mm. So animals evolved this. Um, there is a 100% correlation between this sort of love or bonding in animals and their family life. So it is, you know, only, it is only animals that raise their children and a lot of animals don't. It's only the ones that raise their children that have this kind of bonding. And it's only the ones where the parents um, cooperate in a complex way with each other, where they have bonding between the parents. So it's really clear what, you know, why that evolved in the animal world. And then the humans, um, we take that, we have that, but we also uh, are a very unusual species in that we extend that to friends. And so we do all kinds of cool stuff with like loving people who aren't related to us that is not true for most animals at all. Um, but nonetheless, it's all about people. And now we take uh, those metal systems that are about people and we apply them to all these other things, loving a place, loving nature, loving your hobby, loving your cell phone, whatever it might be. Um, and uh, hilarity ensues, that's the book. <laughs> you know, all, kind of, all kinds of stuff, all of the interesting stuff happens there. Yeah. Um, and we can get into to more of it if you want. Oh, absolutely. Because in researching your work, and again, full confession, I haven't read the book yet, but in just, you know, the um, sort of ancillary information that's right. available. Yeah, I'm deeply, deeply fascinated by this because it, from an evolutionary perspective, from a mimetic perspective, but, you know, the, the one thing that I came up with uh, to, to try to sort this out is it's almost like a social acceptation to use that fancy word it, it is sort of we evolved as these um you know as our sentience increased our our mm -hmm. uh, ability and social uh cohesion uh, tribal cohesion or whatever you want to call it increased that the the emotive capacity uh seems to have risen with that as well and so that the love of a of a family member or or extended family member or the unit of the tribe ex uh, members of the tribe etc that that now in this modern era we have these things that we we feel this kind of an asymmetrical relationship right with a cell phone or a vehicle or a, mm -hmm. a mountain or something like that but again i'm thinking social acceptation because we have this like you just said we, we're everything's on board for us to have this bond or this relationship with something that provides something for us it provides satisfaction uh that, uh, whatever it is, hedonistic response or whatever you're talking. So right. yeah, it's just wide open uh, fascination with your work on this because uh, it really kind of reverse engineers um, or, or maybe offers different insight into what love is and and what, not necessarily what, why we express it. I mean, we could see the pro-adaptive reasoning behind it, but just it's another insight, I, I suspect, into love. So that when we do uh, profess a love for a sports car or uh, mm -hmm. a particular restaurant or something like that. And we feel those, that affect is there, you know? Um, right. Yeah, that's that, just, to me, is fascinating. That's one of the most gratifying responses I get to the book is when people say, um, you know, I read the book, it was super interesting. I now know more about stamp collecting than I, you know, why people <laughs> love their goofy little hobbies or objects or whatever it is. Um, but really, I now understand love at a deeper level and therefore i understand the people i love and my relationship with them at a deeper level mm -hmm. and one of the one of the points in the book is that love remains fundamentally about people even in most cases where we're loving an object so a lot of times when we love and you know a a, a keepsake right a souvenir, um, a photograph, mm -hmm. uh, all of these things are relationships with people in disguise. Um, I, one example that I think is a great example with uh, a guy who was really proud of and, and loved these gold coins that he got as a gift from his father. Um, and then later he discovered that his father had been having a very long time affair and his mother and father split up and he uh, blamed his father. He thought his father was you know, in the wrong on this and came to really hate his father as a result mm -hmm. of that. And of course, as soon as he 
started hating his father. He didn't want the coins anymore. He didn't love the coins anymore. Okay. In, in fact, not only he didn't even sell them. He gave them away. He didn't want anything to do with them. Wow. So what that shows is that his relationship with the coins was really uh, sort of an extension of his relationship with his dad and his love for the coins rose and fell as his feelings about his dad rose and fell. Okay. And that's just one example, but there's lots of examples in lots of different ways that the things we love are really ways of connecting with people. In, in the case of the coins, it's sort of a symbolic connection, mm -hmm. um, but a lot of times it's a more practical kind of connection. You know, I love my television because my friends come over and we watch the game together and I connect with my friends in yep. this way. So it's, it's often a very practical kind of connection. In fact, I've got some data that shows cell phones. I mean, why do people love cell phones? It's partly because, oh, I play games on it and I have this you know, connection to my phone. But the phones, of course, connect us to other people that we call or we text or we communicate in all kinds of other ways. And the more friends a person has, the more they tend to love their cell phone because it's connecting them to more people. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And it, it offers that same kind of, con <clears throat> so it's almost the trickery of the connection in our brains. Um, I So I'm connected with you on uh, a Zoom video format, um, mm -hmm. but my brain doesn't know that. My brain thinks I'm talking to somebody right now when I'm just looking at pixels and, and photons, right. <laughs> which is what I would do in the same room with you, but the, the pixelation would not be the same. So so it's a simulation of sorts. And uh uh, so that 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 you become more and more connected with your phone as you sort of have this uh, prism or this this fractal kind of thing going on with connections and people. So social media is a good example of that. If you're using your phone for social media and you're getting a lot of uh, dopamine hits from connections and love and support and all these things, I could see right. where that it's almost like Chalmers talks about that extended mind. I guess this is like an extended psycho emotive kind of relationship right or maybe i'm getting too deep and strange no I, I think that's it is the extended mind is very much a, a part of this okay the first time i saw this was about 20 years ago i'm guessing um, i was in helsinki uh i was giving a talk there and i was going out to dinner with a group of students and we wanted to find a decent restaurant and the tax structure in Finland is such that restaurants are extremely expensive and nobody knew any good restaurants because they, they they could never afford to go to a restaurant yeah. so they didn't know where to go. And they said, well, we have other friends who have more money and they sometimes go to restaurants. We'll get a recommendation from them. So we're walking down the street and they start phoning. This was in Helsinki, there was one of the big leaders on cell phones this was before people had cell phones everywhere. They okay. start phoning their friends and then their friends are like, I'm not sure, but I have a friend. And so they start phoning their friend. Uh -huh. And it felt to me like the people that I was walking down the street with were 100% were there. And the people you know, on the phone or getting the text message were 50% there. And then the people they were messaging were 25% there. <laughs> and so it was it, the, the, the sort of a person's presence with you instead of being this discreet, you know, either they're with you or they're not with you. Right. It became this gradual kind of continuum where they can be more with you or less with you. Yeah, a drift of sorts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> percentiles of drifting <laughs> of association. That's that's interesting. And and uh, and what a useful utility uh, for all the shadow aspects of modern communication to be able to be walking down the street. We couldn't do that forty years ago. You know, it just doesn't right. seem. Well, we could, but it would be like stop at a store and borrow the telephone for a minute and call somebody. It's such, so much more convenient. The, the, there are, you know, the the incessant game playing on the phones yeah. is probably not a good thing. But the ability when you're late or something happens to just communicate with the person mm -hmm. is so nice. And a lot of younger people have never sort of lived in a world where you couldn't do that where you would be sitting somewhere, you're going to meet your friend and you're there and you're waited for an hour and you have yeah. no idea what's happened to this person. Did they forget? Did they get in an accident? You know, and it could be three hours before you find out what's going on. And that was a normal part of life. Yeah. That was very unpleasant. I'm really glad that's done with. 
Yeah, absolutely. I do. I do check in with myself periodically to try to remember what life was like before 1996 or 98, mm -hmm. <clears throat> before I got wired into the, you know, and even even it wasn't until the mid 2000s that I started really doing more online stuff. But yeah, just that period of time in my life, going back, you have to, I, I think it's healthy to check in if we have that ability to uh, introspect yeah. that way. Uh, and like you said, the young ones, they, they don't have that so much. But, um, you know, your story about the gold coins reminded me, um, I was having lunch with my wife earlier, and we, we, uh, we don't have TV per se, but we have YouTube. So we'll watch whatever comes up on the suggestions. And there was a, uh, I guess, Vogue magazine has a channel and they had Iman on there. And they were touring Amon and David Bowie's um, Catskills, I guess, away from the city home, you know, their mm -hmm. country place. <clears throat> and so David Bowie's been gone for a while. And Amon was, I, I assume this interview was less than a year old because she was talking about COVID and being socked in and things like that. And she said that the house at first when he passed um, gave her, you know, the typical kind of response when somebody dies and now the home's empty and all these things remind you. Uh, but she went through this whole in the in in this twelve minute interview and in walk around the house. Um, it was kind of an interesting cathartic experience because she went through the stages of um, grief with the house. And yeah. first, the house, as I would suspect anybody who's lost a partner or a parent or anything, that the house hurts, you know, and it it it's um, something you can't really reckon with maybe right then and there, but she, again, obviously she probably has a place in Manhattan or something. Uh, so going to the house was painful, but then the house became her therapeutic agent uh, with the little uh, objects in, in the house, the art mm -hmm. and some of the pictures. And, and there was a self portrait that David had done. Uh, so she just went through this beautiful cathartic experience, uh, right? Just as she was basically like, this is my home, you know, this, these are some of my, bric-a-brac and objet to art and things like that and here's the furniture and it was you know it was nicely appointed house but anyway it was just i was catching the backstory through the perspective of of what you're talking about uh and it sort of just clicked with me now as we're talking when you mentioned the coins that she went through this full healing process and now the home is a beautiful uh cocoon uh for her and it it keeps his memory alive and it's it's mm -hmm. where she's come out the back end of uh of grieving uh for the most part that it's now a positive uh, experience for her in the house. It's it's a nurturing uh, place to remember uh, the partner. So anyway, I thought I'd throw that in as another, perhaps an yeah. example of that kind of attachment that we have with inanimate objects that, uh, right. that elicit these types of emotions. Yeah. Um, and, and, and how, you know, I talk in the book about uh, this phrase from another consumer researcher, a very famous guy named Russell Belk, who says, uh, when you first start talking to someone about a, you know, a product or an object that is important to them, it seems that they're having a person thing relationship with this. But then as you talk more, it always turns out to be person thing person, right? So it's Iman and then the house and then David Bowie, right? Right. right. It's always a you know, person thing person. It's really the connection, the way the object is an intermediary that connects us to other people, mm. gives the objects uh, that kind of meaning. Um, and in, because you can value things. I mean, there's a, a distinction I make between valuing something and loving something. So um, I have you know, retirement funds. I value them a great deal. Mm. But if someone said, hey, uh, I'll trade you your retirement funds for these other funds, which are 10% bigger, I wouldn't hesitate for a moment. I mean, of course, of yeah. course I'll make that trade, right? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I, I value them, but I don't, con there's no, I don't have any emotional connection in that way. But if someone said to me, you know, um, your dogs are, are really cute, uh, but I've got this other dog here that's 10% cuter. Do you want to trade dogs? Like, are you insane? No. Right, right. Um, so love creates this kind of connection that has us often behave in what an economist, at least an old school, narrow-minded economist might see as irrational ways mm -hmm. because we, and that's kind of what love is for. Right. Love, you know, love evolves in animals. The parents, whether they call it bonding in animals. So the parents bond with their offspring 
so right. that the parent will feed and protect the offspring. Well, you know, two things, which in, you know, if you, if you think of it just in an ego focused way, right, isn't the best thing for the parent, right? They're doing this work and the kid's never going to, the offspring's not going to repay them directly. But right. love is this evolutionary mechanism that creates that behavior um, where they, you know, give altruistically. Yeah. And so it creates these kinds of connections. Yeah, and and thus is born altruism as a social construct, I suppose, or as a, a social normative, perhaps. Uh, it's a, certainly a controversial one because there are the ones who are folks who say that you know selfishness is is much more uh, pro adaptive or or self maintaining or whatever, and you know. And, and and I try not to be binary in that sense, like, well, there's a time to be selfish and there's a time to be altruistic. Yeah. And when you're a parent, you better well be altruistic. Otherwise, you're not going to turn out uh, a child. Perhaps it will be well. But when it comes to uh, feeding and taking care of yourself, you do need to be that. So, so, yeah, obviously, that's a whole other conversation. And I thought of something that this is really weird. And I tend to think of weird things like when it comes to altruism, even within if I bracket myself, I could be what I would this is, I don't know if this is a phrase, a word or not, but like auto altruistic, like I could give up something about myself today or do something I may not like today that would be uh, a hindrance to my hedonic scale or whatever to take care of myself for tomorrow or set myself up for next week. So right. I was thinking about that again, when I was researching your work, I'm like, well, we do that to ourselves, uh, you know, in, in a very selfish sense, but it nonetheless, and, and my wife and I always joking, it's like, well, our tomorrow selves will thank us for doing whatever yes. X today. That's a pain in the ass and that, you know, we got to get through it, but we won't have to do it tomorrow. So in a way you could argue for altruism in your own selfish way, you know, your own selfish uh, interests, I guess. And we're often not very altruistic towards our future selves. Right? No, no. We're often very, very selfish. It's like, I know my future self is not going to be happy I did this, but my present yeah. self really wants to eat that cookie. Yeah, yeah, right. And so I'm just going to eat that cookie in the next 20 after it. That's because, it. you know, to hell with my future self. That's know? right. He can deal with it. He can deal with it. Yeah, <laughs> Oh, that's too funny. And before we hit record, I, I, let's l let's bring this out now for the YouTube audience, because I, I like to watch my analytics and maybe our best capture is within the first five to eight minutes. So um, we were talking about words and descriptions for things. And, um, you know, what is the love of objects and what is a user friendly term that could be applied? So um, I'll present that. I'll allow you to present that. Um, but the one word that I thought of uh, when we were talking is there's the term transjective, um, which is neither subjective nor objective, but huh. it is transjective. And so how could you generate like transjectophilia or something like that? So it is, it is this sort of correspondence between the subject and the object or the middle, the meta ground between the subject and the object. But again, that's not an easy term to like just fling out at an audience, a general audience and say, right. transjectophilia, <laughs> you love yourself. Anyway, I throw that out just between you and me. And But, but an ask the point. audience, ask the audience what uh, you were saying to me. Okay, so here, here for, for the audience, if anyone knows this or can figure it out, I'd be very curious. So, um, they they say that you know there's this old quote that homosexuality is the the love that dare not speak its name. Um, well, people when if you love something other than a person, that's the love that has no name, whether it wants to speak it or not. There really is no good word for that. Um, the best word is philia, and right there are all these specific kinds of philia, right? So like, enophilia is love of wine, and you know as you go on. Mm -hmm. um, but the reason I don't just use the word philia, um, even though it literally means the non-sexual love of something, which is what we're talking about here, mm -hmm. and there is also the sexual love of objects, which is a different thing, um, which we can talk about a little bit. Uh, but uh, the, the sort of the standard, you know, I, I love football is just, you know, I love my car is the non-sexual love that we have for these things. Mm -hmm. um, if I call that philia, people will say, well, what about pedophilia? Mm -hmm. And um, you also mentioned another word, necrophilia, right? Yeah. Which are both sexual attractions. And so the weird thing is, if philia literally means the non-sexual love of something, and there's another word, eros, which means the sexual love of something, how do we get these words like pedophilia 
which are which mean the non-sexual love of children when it doesn't involve love of children at all. It only involves sexual attraction to children. It seems very strange. So one explanation that I've heard, which might be correct, but just doesn't, I, I'm a little dubious about, is that at some point pedophiles themselves created this term as a sort of try and gain social acceptance mm. for their practices, um, which I don't know, uh, maybe doesn't sit right, but maybe. So I don't really know why it would have come up. The, the, an, uh, a complete speculation on my part is maybe it arose during uh, sort of Victorian times when the idea of even mentioning sexual attraction to, to children was just seen as too coarse. And so this was like a euphemism mm -hmm. because the, the other term was just too coarse to be spoken in public or something. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because we'd be saying pedo erotica or something like that as a as an acceptable term for that. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I think you're right. I th or the media uh, softened it. And then I'm not talking about modern media, but like, you know, mid 20th century sensational tabloidy, whatever was going on, you know, whenever that phrase mm -hmm. again, like you said, maybe it was soft peddling um, the concept and people got it. You know, it was it wasn't like it needed to be explained. Yeah. I don't know, but yeah, it, it's it's unusual. Yeah, but I would think pedo erotica would be or pedo uh, predation or something like that, sexual right. predation. You know, something <laughs> something a little more uh, specific and explicit uh, that that lays the case out uh, for that behavior. So yeah, so to the audience, um, you know, so it's so philia, uh, like philosophilia, which we will mm -hmm. engage with a little bit here. Um, you know, is is it because there's at least five or seven or more types of love, depending on, you know, who you, who you ask. Right. And, but, and I can't find a good fit for, for a, a non, uh, uh, like you said, a non Eros. Um, and even Eros has um, connotations or contexts that go beyond sexual attraction. I, I, one philosopher that I follow uses the term Eros to, de to describe the lure to the future. And that's Whitehead in his process relational metaphysics. Mm -hmm. And he uses the Eros uh, as a sort of draw or an attraction to right. the next corresponding event as events fall into sequence. Um, so, so yeah, even Eros can be shifted around or put on a spectrum, I guess, in terms of, of what it's trying mm -hmm. to describe. But yeah, I mean, just, just the idea of what is uh, what is a an affection for a non living entity or or mm -hmm. object? I mean, I, okay. So if I want to get weird again, like bodies are objects, right? We are objects. Okay. So so the, again, that's where the term transjective comes in. You know, we are subject object at the same time. I am very abstractly a subject, you know, and even that is, uh, if you want to get full Buddha, you know, that's even debatable, right? <laughs> you know, wh what is the subject here? You know, who is the subject and, and who is the experiencer, et cetera, et cetera. But really, I mean, this thing right here is fairly concrete, at least in my reporting, and you could probably mm -hmm. verify that. So it's, it's all confused. It's very strange. Uh, to, and, and again, maybe somebody who likes words can sort that out. Yeah. Lexicographers well, could come on and straighten right. this out. Well, well, the human brain is really, it's interesting. So there's something um, that you may be familiar with called the social brain thesis. Okay. And this is the idea among evolutionary uh, biologists um, and neuroscientists that the human brain evolved its sort of unique large size, uh, most of which is uh, three quarters of, the, of your brain is neocortex. Mm -hmm. um, and this is it's the the size of the neocortex that makes the human brain so much larger than other primates brains uh so we got this big neocortex um in order to think about people uh that there used to be this idea that what set humans apart from the other animals was that we were tool users and of course some other animals do you do use tools although we use them a lot more in a more sophisticated ways. Uh, but tool use <clears throat> came after the development of our brain. So it wasn't really the reason for the development. It sort of was a nice byproduct of it. 
But what was happening is as we were developing this big brain is we were learning much more complicated ways to organize societies and groups and also better ways to function as teams. We've always mm -hmm. been sort of team players and we were able to collaborate and, and work in teams more effectively um, with our big brains. And interestingly, also in animals, uh, larger brain size in a lot of animals is linked to uh, parental cooperation. Mm -hmm. Simply the mother and the father cooperating to feed and raise the family is a complicated enough process that the animal had to develop a larger brain in order to create that sort of inter-animal cooperation mm -hmm. uh, as well. So our brains, they, they have physical parts of the brain that are sort of devoted particularly <laughs> to, to interpersonal interactions. So if you see a machine do some task, that will be processed in one part of the brain. If you see a human being do the exact same task, that'll be processed in a different part of the brain. Uh, so there's really a big distinction in the brain between people and not people. And love is one of these mental processes that's reserved for people. And when we love objects, there's always some kind of a confusion going on in the brain that confuses that object with a person or links it to a person. So sometimes it's because the object is anthropomorphic, it like looks like a person, maybe it's got a face on it or something, right. and our brain sort of treats it like a person. <clears throat> but sometimes it's that we just associate the object with a person, right? It was a gift from this person. And so it, it sort of gets connected to a person. And sometimes it becomes part of our own identity. It's connected to us. Mm -hmm. And um, that gives it this sort of human quality and makes it something that we love. So the real difference isn't object versus not object. It's people as objects or whatever versus everything else. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's hard wiring in your brain that, that rests on that kind of a distinction. Yeah, yeah. Our, our higher, higher order sentience seems to, uh, to bring that along with it. There's a really neat lecture and I can send you the link for it. Um, and I, if anybody wants it, you can comment and I'll, I'll attach it to your comment. Uh, the University of California has a great YouTube channel, and I think it was UC San Diego, there was a lecture, they have a huge anthropogeny series, and the lecture that I'll send to you if you're interested, um, talks about that, it's like this one flashpoint in history of our evolution, um, and I think it was 4.5 million years ago, and we had just split from Homo, uh, wasn't, oh god, Nealdi or whatever that one, mm -hmm. it was one of our closer relatives. Um, okay. So clade in our tribalhood or whatever. And um, so anyway, we had just split off and we had this thing that they called an RGAP 11A gene that converted by a mutation to an RGAP 11B gene mm -hmm. by like six nucleotides or maybe 11 nucleotides. But what was interesting is it, it mutated and then it didn't express that mutation for another half a million years. Huh. Um, and this brings us to right about 4 million years, which was still about 2 million years before we started becoming, you know, Mm -hmm. some quasi sapient or whatever whatever it was um so we were a couple different layers of our uh before this species um but what was interesting is that that expression they say brought on uh the folding uh cortical front frontal cortex you know the big mm. folds and the stuff like that and the usefulness of those big folds because there's other animals the cetaceans have like big foldy brains but they don't uh necessarily process the way ours do probably because of social uh behavior anyway i could send that to you because there's a real fascinating place where you can put a pin right on where we went from being very much instinctive mm -hmm. uh sort of in the moment kind of creatures to being gradually more self-reflective gradually more uh, self-aware kind of thing. And, and uh, that's, yeah. that's one thing I use to, to help sort things out in terms of why did we, how did we end up like this and how did we get there? But if you're, if you're interested, I'll be happy to pass it along. Sure. It's like a 30 minute lecture. There was actually two other uh, paleoanthropologists on the chat series, but I think the middle guy, and, and like I said, you, you'll, you'll see it, but it's a, it's a neat lecture. And they, they follow up with all the charts and graphs and squigglies and things like that, that uh, help to explicate things thoroughly. But just the takeaway on it is that on top of everything you just said, there was this one happenstantial thing that just kicked in i don't it i don't know if it was uh environmental or if it was just a 
just happened. I, you know, I don't know what th that I either forgot or they didn't maybe cover it in that lecture. But yeah, it's just fascinating how we how we came on board and and uh, sort of by uh, not necessarily selection, I don't think, but by just interaction that we came to be the social animals that we are and the the deeply social creatures that we are. Um, that always fascinates me that that yeah. one species um, has managed to do it. Uh, and and to be honest, between you and me, I don't think it's so pro adaptive anymore. <laughs> I think we hit a sweet spot at some point. <laughs> I also I sometimes wonder if our sentience is, <laughs> you know, I mean, we have the opportunity. It's the choice now, and that's one of the, I guess, one of the funny ironies of being human is, you know, we have the choice to to be uh, pro adaptive with this high level of intelligence and this high capability yeah. for socialization and for uh for processing thought much more efficiently and and broadly than than anything else on the planet so yeah it's a mixed well, bag i guess we're also less social than we used to be yeah um, so a, a lot of times people have this idea like uh there's an article i saw uh, as i was writing the book that sort of struck me where the person said you know back when we were evolving you know, as back in evolutionary times, we had to worry about saber-toothed tigers. But now, <laughs> instead of worrying about saber-toothed tigers, we have to worry about office politics mm. you know, and our boss. Um, and there's some truth to that, in that now that saber-toothed tigers are extinct, they're less of a worry than they were before that they were extinct. But really, the big threat, what we had to worry about always was other people mm -hmm. right? the saber tooth tigers were out there but really the big sources of rewards and punishments in, in a human's life were always the other people that they were with and in fact we are much less interdependent with other people now than we used to be because we have things like money yeah yeah and so like if you think well, what does money do one of the things you know uh, yeah it allows for exchange but it also is an amazing mechanism for storing things mm -hmm. right so if you have a whole bunch you you kill an elephant and right, you've got all this meat um before money you just had to like hope your village could eat it before it spoiled because that <laughs> yeah. was all there was but you know later you could take the meat and you could sell it to other people and then the money you could keep and it wouldn't spoil, and then you could go back later and buy meat with the money. So it, was, it became like a, a mechanism of storing the meat, in effect, mm -hmm. uh, over a long period of time. Uh, we're able, with money and other kinds of tools, to do a lot of things that we used to depend on other people to do. Yeah. So we're able to be less social and more <clears throat> independent. Uh, and you even see that in social class, um, in any given society, that the wealthier someone is, the more individualistic they are, and the less sort of enmeshed in a social community they are. Because just as a, a simple example, if you're a working class person, um, and you need, so, you know, to, someone to watch your kids, you're likely to call on a relative to do that because you can't afford a babysitter. But if you're an upper class person, you hire a nanny or you, or you hire a babysitter. So you don't need that social relationship to meet that need. Now you have money you can mm -hmm. meet that need with instead. And so the richer people are, the, just the less invested with other people they become. Yeah. And as our whole society gets richer, we become more detached from the other people around us. So really it's, you know, it was that, human society 50,000 years ago that was most concerned with office politics, um, we're less concerned with it now. They didn't have an office. They would have called it village politics or clan politics, but it's the same thing. Right, right. Yeah, and, and money, it's a stand-in of sorts, I guess. It's a social contract or, uh, or, or, or a, a psychotechnology that ha has become less abstract, I suppose, uh, because we come up with paper and, co and metal and things like that to represent that wealth. Right. Um, but really, what is it based on? It's based on agreements. It's based right. on, yeah. And that to me is just kind of mind blowing when you just pointed out, you know, the, um, 
the phenomena that that results from that that we 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 divide ourselves and we we um, order ourselves and rank ourselves mm -hmm. and do all these different things based again on just agreements and um, and again a, an abstraction of thought that that has been a been a replacement for basic bartering or exchange or uh, even going further back what the because I love and I said this in a couple other interviews recently I love watching those documentaries of um, uh, tribes in New Guinea or or in, in the Amazon basin and there's none of that none of that exists they they have a routine and everybody um, sort of has a place in the system and you know they they do what they need to do to make sure they're fed uh, they don't really have too much of a big future plan. They don't have, you know, investing or retirements mm -hmm. or things like that. They know what to do with the elders. They know what to do with the the people who fall sick and ill. And uh, well, I mean, they can't do a lot, but they do what they can for that. And so it's interesting to. And so I, I last time I brought this up, I invoked anarcho primitivism, which is, of course, a critique of modernity. Well, yeah, I guess mm -hmm. modernity or whatever, you know, anything that has happened in the last few hundred years. And I, I, it's certainly untenable in the sense that we could go back to that kind of living that, that we're way, way beyond being able to do that. But just to look back on it and say, well, what works in those systems and what works with the um, community structure that's going on there? And it's probably not replica, re replicable uh, out for a mega society that we are now, especially with us being connected electronically. But just the idea that that there's far less... Um, precedence or or um desire to commodify things the way we do as you're saying you know in a modern society with money and things like that and again i don't i wouldn't know what the hell to do with that i don't know anything about economics or about you know how to forecast <laughs> you know, a good way forward but it's just an interesting way to you know to look back and see how we did things uh 10 to thirty thousand years you know before the younger driest period you know and and when we were running around a lot more than we before we settled uh to see what they were what they're what it's such a beautiful gift to have those people still here to show us what we were doing twenty thousand years ago uh, I, I have a friend um amelia whose father uh, she's Amelia Rappaport, who was Roy Rappaport, who was a very famous, prominent anthropologist. Okay. And we were friends uh, in high school. And at one point, she went, uh, she left for a year because her whole family went with him to live in New Guinea with uh, one of these sort of Aboriginal <laughs> tribes for a year. And um, I asked her when, when she got back, of course, well, what did you do? While, while you were there, and she says, basically, all you do is sit around all day eating mangoes and play with babies. And that's <laughs> that's basically that's basically your life, you know. Um, <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> she found it a little tedious. I, oh, I, I'm sure. I was big on the romance of the whole thing. All of us, so cool you did this. She was she wasn't like totally thrilled with the the experience, perhaps. Um, but it is it is funny. It was certainly a, a time with a lot less entertainment <laughs> than we have now. Oh, yeah. I think our modern social selves would have a it would be uh, whatever the opposite of future shock is. It would be uh, paleo shock or whatever. Right. I don't even I, I fantasize. I, I romanticize it like, oh, yeah, right. it'd be great. I'll go pull my weight. I'll stab or kill whatever need and bring it in and and, you know, help eat and just. But yeah, I, I, I couldn't live that way. But it is it is fascinating nonetheless. <clears throat> and of course, there's the headlines now. This uh, one last surviving tribal person in South America uh, passed away this week, I suppose. And, uh, you know, chapter closed. His tribe was slaughtered for beef or whatever and in the Amazon. And but just the idea that um, we have that lens, uh, it's like a living laboratory, you know, right. and 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 I was watching not to keep muddy. I, I, I tend to Sorry, I go on tangents, but I was watching something on Baudrillard last night, and I never knew this about uh, one of his points he was making about the simulation, that he was referencing uh, an incident in the Philippines where a tribe had been pulled out of the, the jungle mm -hmm. uh, by the colonial mechanisms and were, were being... Um, unwilded or whatever and being put clothes and books and things like that and some anthropologists said uh, you can't you know this was i can't remember when this was i think it might have been the 50s or the 60s but i'm probably wrong and they said well you can't do that we, we, they've got to get taken back and so they after i don't remember how much time they took these 
poor people back to the jungle and they took him to virgin forest and they said, okay, go be yourselves again. And they put him back in this environment. And that's what Baudrillard was trying to use as an example of the simulation, which is obviously very complex and abstract. And I certainly couldn't do it any justice to try to explain it, but it gives you an insight into you're pulled from your environment, you're exposed to this whole completely different environment, and then you're returned to the environment all within your own lifetime or within the lifetime of the tribes people. Uh, and what do they do with that? They, they've already, you know, they've been exposed to something completely alien and foreign, right. maybe affected by that mimetically, and then reinserted into their previous existence. And I, I'd love to see some research on that to see <laughs> <laughs> what their poor minds went through the 10 years following that. And because obviously folkloric um, communication and, and passing wisdom down to the younger generations. I mean, how do you, how do you weave that into your, your narrative? Uh, and, and what delir deliterous or delir deleterious uh, affect was there on their, their culture um, to have wow. been just run through that whole unnecessary thing. <laughs> So anyway, it was fascinating. Yeah. More so, more so than Baudrillard's work and the simulacra and the simulation and all that. I was just like, oh my god, they really did that to a tribe. They pulled them out of the jungle, stuck you know clothes on them, and gave them rosaries, and then just shoved them right back in the jungle after probably a couple, maybe I don't know a couple of years. I'll have to check. I just found out about this last night, so I'll have to read more into it. <laughs> but a couple like, years they could probably deal with. Yeah. But if you lose skills, you need a lot of skills to live in the jungle like that. And you lose those skills if you don't, you know, if you don't use them. <laughs> right I, back to I the could missionary. See, take people out for like 20 years and try oh. and put them back. They they probably couldn't survive after that. Yeah. It'd be like taking a dog, you know, a right. wild dog and then domesticating it, feeding it, spoiling it, <laughs> and throwing it, it back out. <laughs> there would be a hard uh, learning curve. <laughs> yeah. I, I look at my dogs sometimes. And I think like these these two, they would last like thirty seconds in the wild. <laughs> I don't right. know what their ancestors. You know, your ancestors, those wolves would look at you with disdain. Chewy toy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they would. There would be the horror. What have you become? <laughs> I know you have my genes, but what happened? <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. Sometimes they, there was that TV show, Life After Humans, and I think about that. I'm like the domesticated animals that we keep. Uh, they would not last long. Cattle, sheep, uh, chickens, yeah. all the stuff that we've domesticated would just, the, the predators would have a field day, literally, with those with those things, as well as the dogs that are probably under 20 or 25 pounds. Uh, they would, cats, domestic cats might do okay, but uh, small dogs uh, would, would be... Uh, easy, easy protein for, for however long months, a few months, maybe yeah. <laughs> but anyway. Um, but yeah, it's uh, gosh, where do we, where do we, we, where do we go back to, uh, to get, oh, oh I know what I want to ask you. Um, you had said, if we want to talk about um, sort of the Eros uh, love that is expressed with objects, but also before we go there, the love of an object, I imagine it can become pathological perhaps or beyond uh, a healthy right. range. Is there, have you had any uh, uh, opportunity to research that and, and look in the literature for that? Right, well, I've done, there's, there's a number of different ways that that can happen, right? So I haven't, I'm not truly really expert on these people. I haven't really looked into it. Um, there is something that there's a few proponents of this and they are, they're calling them, they're saying, well, we're not heterosexual. We're not homosexual. We are objective sexual. Mm -hmm. So unlike uh, what I what I study, which is sort of the non-sexual love of, you know, uh, why you love your sweater, these are people who have sexual love for various types of objects and say that that is their sort of natural sexual orientation. Interestingly, um, almost all of these people uh, are somewhere on the autism spectrum. Okay. And they might also, there's a theory that they also uh, have a unusual phenomenon called synesthesia, mm. where some one type of sense, you know, like synesthesia is like it feels you'll smell colors. Mm -hmm. You'll smell something and there'll be colors, or you'll see something and it'll you'll hear, you know, your visual, you'll get light into your eyes will create an auditory uh, cue right. in your brain. You'll hear the, a sound as a result of that. So it mixes up the sentences, senses uh, in this way. And because they're uh, autistic, they don't, they find sort of normal human connections difficult. Um, 
but they find these objects, they actually can have a sense of through the synesthesia of intuitive connection to these objects, which is greater than their sense of intuitive connection to other people. So this is definitely not to sort of, well, you know, this person really loves his cell phone and he loves it so much, he's gonna like become, you know, have this, become this no, it's, it's, a, it's a fundamentally different thing. Mm -hmm. And it seems tied to, to very unusual neurological patterns. Um, but on the much more normal side, uh, yeah, things can be uh, a problem in people's lives. Um, and there's a couple of reasons, situations in which this happens. One is that some people just get very, uh, people need human companionship, they need close relationships. But if someone is tries to have close relationships and fails for whatever reason, they're rebuffed, they, they're isolated, they're teased, and so their social relationships aren't going well. Um, sometimes they'll respond to that by just getting very interested in some hobby and just trying to lose themselves in some sort of a hobby or an interest. Mm -hmm. um, my hunch is that the fixation with model trains or video games or whatever it is, um, really is a response to the social needs and the failure to meet their social needs much more than it is a cause. It's not usually the case that like, people just love model trains so much that they don't want to have friends because they just want to spend time with them. No, it's uh, an analogy I, I, I've seen that I like is uh, with little children, um, they can develop these really intense relationships with their stuffed animals, you know, their teddy bear or whatever. But when mom shows up, they you know, weigh that teddy bear, they don't care about the teddy bear, they want to be with mom. Mm -hmm. right? They're not okay. like rejecting mom to be with the teddy bear. <laughs> yeah, right. So it's the same kind of thing where I don't really think those are necessarily the cause of their loneliness. I think it's more just a, an attempt to find some sort of a, 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 a compensation for, for the loneliness. But you do <clears> get used <throat> to things. So people who spend a lot of time alone, um, neurologically, you would think that they would come to crave social companionship more and more, but actually they get acclimated to spending the time alone. Mm. And if they've had a history of bad relationships with people and, and problems socializing, you know, once they've sort of gotten used to spending time alone, if you come and say, hey, let's, you know, don't Uncle Fred, don't spend time, you know, with your model trains again, come with me to this party. Um, they may well say no, because they've gotten used to being alone. Neurologically, that's comfortable for them, more comfortable sure. for them. And their memory is like the last time I went to a party, you know, people didn't want to talk to me. So they don't have a good, a good memory on that other alternative either. So that's one way in which things go wrong. The other way, um, there are two sort of different aspects of social relationships that it's useful to keep uh, in mind. So one is how closeness, how close your relationships are, and the other is social status. Mm -hmm. And both of these are neurological sort of parts of the brain. We actually, loneliness, if you don't, if you don't have enough close relationships, you don't get to see those people enough, you feel lonely. Um, and loneliness is a neurological, mm -hmm. physical, phenomenon with strong physical effects on your on your health, on your mental health, your physical health, all kinds of things. It's an extremely powerful you know, physical kind of experience. Um, status is also something that your brain keeps track of automatically. It ranks mm -hmm. people in status and it keeps track uh, of status automatically. Um, and so you can tell the difference between closeness versus status and that if you don't have enough closeness, you feel lonely. If you don't have enough status, you feel humiliated or disrespected, right? And those are a little related, but they're pretty different from each other. Um, even though both of those are sort of in fundamental parts of the human experience, different people in different societies can emphasize one or the other more. Okay. Um, and in some societies, like our society, 
we're not the most status focused society in the world, but we're 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 also far from the most egalitarian. All right. And we we allow we allow for a lot of status differences and think that's perfectly normal. Um, other societies are more status focused. Uh, Korean, the Korean language has a number, I was told seven, I'm sure there are Korean speakers out there who may tell me that's not correct, so don't quote me on that, but it has a, a, quite a few different levels of status. And in order to speak to someone in Korean, you have to know your relative status to them and keep track of that at all times for all the, it affects like the way the language works. Okay. Um. So that is like an even more status focused, you know, society than, than, than we have here. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, happiness seems to be associated very strongly with having, you don't have to have lots and lots of close relationships, but you need to have at least a few in, in close relationships and then it's about the quality of those relationships. And so those close relationships really pay off in terms of your psychological well-being in a big way. Um, whereas status does not. Um, if you're at the very bottom, so there was a study done by Ed Diener, a very famous psychologist who studies happiness, uh, the late Ed Diener, um, in which he asked people, you know, do you feel strongly, I think the wording was something, do you feel strongly disrespected in the past couple of days or something like this? And it was only a, a very small percentage of the population. This was also not done in America. This was done, I, I forget the country, it was in a developing country. Only a very small percentage of the population said yes. But those people who said yes were really, really unhappy. Mm. Was, so being it was only the very bottom end but if you're at that very bottom end it's really really bad however lots of other studies have shown that for people who aren't you know actively feeling disrespected and humiliated at that moment um focusing on social status is is a big problem it it decreases your happiness the more focused on it you, the less happy you tend to be and um, getting social status doesn't really help. So it's not just that like, oh, I want, you know, I, I want social status. If I had it, then I'd be happy. It's actually people who want social status are unhappy because they want it. And then they get social status and they're still unhappy. It doesn't work for them. Okay. Whereas if you're lonely, you're unhappy. But if you get friends, you're not lonely, you're happy. It works, right? Okay. You, you can, that, that, so there's a real asymmetry there. <clears throat> Um, it is a long sort of roundabout pitch, but the, the way that another way that people get into trouble with objects is a lot of times objects play into social status. So, um, you know, status symbols, and they can be all kinds of status symbols in, in the way this works, but people get attracted to and fixated on objects. It becomes part of an attempt to, you know, raise your social status in ways that put social status constantly at the forefront of your attention. So it's not something that you're ever going to not care about. It's fundamental to people that we care about status. But you really are better off if you can put it on the back burner and focus on other things and not make it the center of piece of your life. And a lot of times people get so caught up with the status and then that becomes caught up with objects mm -hmm. and maybe it's a fancy car maybe it's a fancy phone maybe it's a designer this right or living in the right neighborhood or you know drinking the right wine or whatever it is but there you know the, there's lots of ways that status plays out and it's not usually a good thing and it's interesting you said that that when one increases their their ranking and status, uh, whether it's with objects or permissions mm -hmm. or whatever, that the level of um, the positive valence doesn't increase or the, the satisfaction doesn't increase. And so I'm wondering, is that is that more of a um, sort of a, a longer period of imprinting and, and socialization that causes that? So in other words, the immediacy of being lonely uh, too happy with just mm -hmm. bringing you into a social situation where you're supported or or there's uh, reciprocity in terms of um, good interactions, et cetera, um, with the social status not bringing about um, a change. Um, is Do you think that's because it's more ingrained through a years right. long of yeah. just continual imprinting, imprinting, et cetera, or whatever but, the process and, is? And I do want to 
to the, if people are interested in the happiness literature and look into this, I want to add a, a couple nuances here. It actually depends on what you're measuring. So if you measure um, like psychological well-being in a lot of ways, status doesn't pay off for you. If you ma measure people's like how happy their emotional, like what their mood is at any given moment, status doesn't pay off for them. But if you ask them about what's called life satisfaction, so like how how well are you doing in life? Um, people who are very high status uh, evaluate their life as like, yeah, I'm doing a little better. So the differences aren't huge, but there there is some payoff if 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 the question is sort of like a version of how high status are you, then being high status kind of pays off for you know for that particular question if that's if that's what you're asking. And a lot of times people look at like if you ask them how well are you doing in life, they translate that in their mind to how high status am I. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> that said, I have this whole theory, and I do not have proof on this, but. I would love to get do some research, and I and I really think I may have may have an insight here. Uh, only time will tell. But I think that there's a difference between status and close relationships um, that you can see, like on the internet. Uh, if you think about status, it's like how many followers do you have? Mm. You can always get more followers. You can always get you know more. Facebook friends, not real friends, but like sort of followers in that sense. Um, and so there's no cost. If you've, if you've got a hundred followers on Twitter, you know, you could have a million followers on Twitter. And then if you got a million, you could have 2 million followers mm -hmm. on Twitter. Um, it kind of goes forever. But with friendship, there's a cost to having friends. You have to spend time with your friends, mm -hmm. you know, the good thing about friends is you can ask them for a favor, but they also get to ask you for favors. Yeah. And if you've got like a hundred close friends, there's gonna be a lot of people asking you for a lot of favors. Yeah. So in terms of your sort of what's effective um, for a, a person in their life, it just having more and more close friends um, isn't really effective because there's a sort of a carrying cost for each relationship. And you just only have a certain amount of time and energy in the world. Um, and, and there are cases where people have looked at this, there's some studies that have said people are very, very extroverted, often don't have more close friends than people who are more introverted mm -hmm. because they're so busy making new friends that they lose their old friends and they get okay. this kind of churn, right? Whereas people who are more introverted, you know, they've got three or four friends, they keep their friends and they still end up in the same place. Yeah. Um, so I think that because you can always increase your status, there's no reason that evolutionarily that that, that would have an off switch. There's no incentive for your brain to say like, don't do that anymore. Because you can always have more. It's the same with money. Why are people never satisfied with how much money they have? Because you can always do more with more money. There's no need for an off switch there. Um, whereas with friends, there is an off switch because there's this sort of optimal point in which you've got enough friends to, to sort of help you when you need it, um, but you don't want to have too many friends or you'll uh, they'll make too many demands <clears throat> on you and you won't have the time for this. Right. Um, and so the way that your brain tells you you're good, you don't need to make any more friends, is it says you're happy, you're okay. good. Okay. You know, you've got enough. Everything's good, don't worry about it. Be happy, right? And the way that your brain keeps telling you, no, no, get more money, get more status, is it says you're not happy. <laughs> Would be happy if you had more of this stuff, but you're not happy because it wants to keep you moving and constantly getting more. Right, right. And I might, in my own, uh, odd world, I would also look that when it comes to status, um, that we project on to those who are at the next level of status. So, you know, we all want to be like that wealthy um, influencer out of, you know, Hollywood or celebrity or whatever it is. 
Um, but I see that too, that there's this projection that goes on. And, and so I'll get young in for a second. So there might be the archetype of the, yeah. you know, the successful person, the, the, the Tony Stark, or even in, in reality, the Elon Musk or, or somebody that's just got it, you know, really put together and, and everything switched on. And, and so I see that as a lure as well to, uh, to aspire to that, but it's vacuous, you know, because as somebody I interviewed a couple interviews back said, um, you know, go ahead and covet Warren Buffett, you know, and when you do cover the entire, the totality of Warren Buffett. So covet the fact that he lost uh, his children and his wife in the process of becoming a very successful person and having billions of dollars. And by lost, I mean, he alienated uh, his wife and, and estranged himself from his, or the children estranged themselves from him probably. So, you know, in other words, he was making this statement that you know it's not always what you think it is and and there are prices like just like you said with making friends there's a cost benefit ratio there and eventually the cost will govern you know how how far you want to go with that but um you know when you're uh maybe so in other words when you're idealizing this status relationship that you know these people that appear to be um in those lofty echelons of <laughs> of <laughs> status nirvana or utopia right. or whatever that there's a there's a shitstorm behind their lives usually and it's not um always what we want to you know want to think it it is <laughs> so, so there's just a cautionary <laughs> uh note there to that i guess that that would be my governing uh, you know not everybody's different but for me and, and and i i don't really look for social status myself i i'm a bizarre mix of being extroverted but at the same time i there's uh, i'm happy to be a recluse you know <laughs> but but i love i love getting in front of groups of people and talking in in a room and so being a social butterfly and mixing uh i don't really have a lot of friends so close friends um so i don't know where i fall on that uh mm. where i where i would be with that um yeah yeah it's it's interesting but for me uh the aspiration to have status uh is off-putting to uh even though i'm doing a like i have this interview series and there may be some micro relevance to that where like there's a few people that watch the videos and stuff that's not what i'm doing it for necessarily i like you have to, to build your brand or do, you know, to, to promote, uh, mm -hmm. your ideas in your market. But, but for me, it's my, my motives are more getting people like you on board and having good conversations and just letting this be an entity in of itself. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there's a necessity for this person to be here communicating with you. Here. So yeah. I might be, I might be dissociated for myself in some ways, <laughs> I, I, anyway, so not to not to talk about myself too much, but yeah, just to get back to the the notion of the archetype of the uh, of the socially relevant person that um, I would see that as a potential governing agent. Like if you could see the the totality of what that person's life is like, or or the spectrum of of their ups and downs, et cetera, uh, perhaps that could be. But I I agree with you. Like money, there doesn't there, and even in our our social normatives there yeah obviously there are people who you know are anti-wealth and they want to you know protest uh the egregious wealth of others but you know i think generally we all seem to accept that yeah there shouldn't be a ceiling you shouldn't have a football player that you know there that has a capped salary that they could earn potentially whatever they want or a ceo or anything like that and i think that's interesting um that we're comfortable with that because there's costs associated with that i guess but then again maybe we're projecting onto those people and it's like playing the lottery and maybe we could be like that someday <laughs> yeah so maybe that's why the permission becomes easy it's like well no no let them be unlimited because you know maybe myself i'll get there one day <laughs> yeah I right. don't know. or or i'll rise up with the boats that yeah rise up. i don't know yeah i don't know um so earlier uh you had mentioned um persons who find themselves erotically attracted to objects, which given the way technology is going and the way like augmented reality is unfolding, um, artificial intelligence is doing their thing and the, the transhumanists are lauding all these lofty ideals about where we're gonna be in 30 or 40 years. Um, you might have to write another book on a sort of deeper, more complex uh, subject object love when we get more wired in i think um we could go from erotica all the way to to just getting lost in um narratives of okay so here's a good example yesterday i'm listening to npr or something on the radio it was one of the shows that um my local public radio hosts and they were talking to a croatian fashion designer who designs virtual clothing for your avatars 
you know, going back to Baudrillard for a minute right. and, the, and the simulacra, um, you know, uh, I, where, where does that go? Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're moving our way into um, an environment and, and the metaverse and all this other. And I have a VR system back here. I love virtual reality, but um, it poses some interesting you know, ethical questions, but also sociological questions or psychological questions. Right. You know, the, the love of an object or the love of a, an experience, I guess this might be uh, more relevant uh, to say an experience. Um, how confused are we going to get and how lost could we potentially get with our primitive primate evolutionary apparatus in our skulls versus that, you know, that yeah. which which in a few years, this thing will be like an old calculator or something. This was well, the fastest machine I could get right. two years ago, but now in a few years, it'll be nothing. <laughs> yeah. So I actually, I, in the book, I've got a chapter on uh, coming technology and, and the sort of promise and perils of this technology. And one area that I think is really interesting, um, I believe that one of the fundamental mechanisms of how love works is that when you love someone or something, you extend your sense of identity. So they, you sort of merge identities with this person or this thing that you love. And I think that it makes a lot of sense, even at sort of for animals, how do you get uh, the parent animal uh, to take care of their offspring? Well, if the, the parent sees the offspring as part of its own self, it will care for the offspring the way it cares for itself. So this produces the, the, the behaviors that um, evolution want, you know, wanted. Evolution, of course, doesn't want anything, but metaphorically, Right. You know, that evolution wanted uh, to see produced uh, in these animals. Um, and today, there's a ton of psychological evidence that when people love other people or objects, they do, in fact, see them much more as part of their identity. Yeah. Now, this is happening already, but there's, there's two things that we always, that are sort of, I call them the charter members of the identity club. And like everyone, no matter who they are, sees these two things as being part of their identity. One is their consciousness mm -hmm. and the other is their body. Right? Okay. Everyone automatically sees your body. And part of the reason you see your body as part of your identity, part of who you are, is that you can control it just by thinking about it. You can't, you can't turn the TV on and off just by thinking about it, but you can move your hand or your leg or whatever it is. And so you can also sense things. Right, you you know you, something touches your foot and you feel it, right in your brain. Um, well, there is technology that is very much being developed at this moment of uh, what they call brain machine interfaces, mm -hmm. which are ways of tapping into the brain. Um, and the best examples are bidirectional, so that you can control a device by thinking about it. And you can also get sense data from the device. Mm -hmm. um, the sense data examples don't go into uh, directly into the brain at this point, but they're, they're sort of working on that. They have other ways mm -hmm. of stimulating nerves with the sense you get a sense of what's, uh, what, what you're sensing mm -hmm. from that machine. Um, and as this technology gets more advanced, one of the big problems is that we've got this skull that is very thick. And if you put things on the outside, it's very hard to get a clear reading on the inside. So it looks like for the foreseeable future, the only way that this is gonna work is to actually drill through the skull and put implants under there. And there's a lot of companies and, and researchers working on these kinds of implants of various kinds. Uh, but when that gets going, and, and as it is already, people are going to feel just an intense sense of love and attachment to these objects. Mm -hmm. Because if you control the object with your thoughts and sense things from the object, it will be a part of your body for all practical purposes and therefore a part of yourself. And if loving something is seeing it as part of yourself, the love for these things is going to be much more intense. So we're going to, we're going to have, a kind of intensity of love for certain types of objects that, that goes well beyond 
how you know what we're capable of today. Mm. Sorry for these noises in the background. Oh, no worries, no worries. This is a <laughs> a no budget <laughs> production here, so folks are just gonna we we don't have uh, slick slick production skills here. So, um, yeah, there's a there's a uh, a person uh, Judith Morris Fernandez was a PhD. Uh, student at MIT and her website uh, is, should still be up and running. This was several years ago that I think she put this out and she did this. Uh, she developed this system uh, with virtual reality. And as you were saying, the skull is really thick. So she was using probably EEG sensors uh, to, uh, to the brain, probably by, I guess they call them squibs or whatever it is that, you know, mm -hmm. attaches to your head. And she was recreating um, psychokinesis with virtual reality. So your brainwave states could make walls disappear, could levitate candles and get that kind of immediate feedback. And and so you're saying that it's, it's bi-directional now. And that's even more impressive because I was pretty impressed by just what she had done by you, uh, you know, a, a causing an effect. And, uh, and so, yeah, yeah, that's going to be, uh, both interesting and terrifying <laughs> and probably in the next 20 or 30 years to see uh, where they go with that. Um, you know, if, if the right people <laughs> develop that and uh, I'd see perhaps as a wonderful uh, amendment to uh, psychotherapy or, or counseling or anything like that, people dealing with trauma maybe, or um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'm curious in my own right. And that's why I bought this virtual reality system for mindfulness and for feedback uh, in real time to sort of de-stress. That's my main motive with mindfulness is to just kind of bring us out of our stressful day, like a lot of people are doing, but also enhancing that through uh, sensory capture. So your visual, your audio, maybe somatic someday uh, to produce um, experiences that um, are um, what people worked really hard to do to have non-dual states or, or um, sort of uh, interesting novel experiences beyond sort of the everyday uh, psychical experience. So that's something I'm interested in. I don't think there's too many people working on it necessarily because it's kind of out there. It's a little fringy. Um, there are mindfulness apps and there are very, you know, they're just calming and relaxing, but I want something that's going to sort of simulate uh, what people call peak experience or maybe non-dual states, which I, I believe are purely neurological. So I think that that could be uh, uh, right. rendered. You know, I'm a naturalist. I'm not going for anything crazy supernatural, but just like to have that higher state just to um, bring about that affect and then uh, come back to reality. And you can do it twice a week or three times a week and and just sort of have a way of and it's certainly not going to be like a, a, a Buddhist monk who sits and spends, you know, uh, several hundred hours a year meditating to get to that state where they're kind of uh, a dissolution of selfness uh, to the degree that you, you 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 come back. And so there's guys like, oh, God, what's the one guy's name? Anyway, he claims to have he's meditated so many thousands of hours that he's kind of just really chilled himself out and he's not mm -hmm. necessarily affected by stress as much and things like that. Um, oh, his many, name? Yeah, many people like this. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. So I had the sort of privilege to work um, with Matthew Ricard. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He is uh, a well-known author. He's also a Buddhist, a Tibetan Buddhist monk. Mm -hmm. He is. Uh, he was born French and got a PhD uh, for one of the natural sciences. I forget which one. Um, and then went from there and. Uh, went to India and became very involved in the meditation Buddhism and eventually became the Dalai Lama's spokesperson, official spokesperson on all things meditation. And uh, if you've heard of this research that um, people do where they take people who meditate and they scan their brains as they're meditating and they you know learn about what's going on inside, mm -hmm. he was very, very instrumental in sort of setting up that research and facilitating that research and getting that going. Um, and so I, I've worked with him on some research projects, not on that, on, on other stuff on uh, related to happiness. And he is a great example. I mean, he's, he's spent thousands and thousands of hours in meditation. And uh, I, I wasn't there, but a, a friend told me the story about him, that they were together and they were uh, flying and they had to uh, get a connecting flight and so their plane arrives late um, and so they only have a few minutes to get a connecting flight and they're told well things that flight got rescheduled 
and now it's leaving from a different runway. And the only way to get there is to like go and get in this taxi and go this other place. And, you know, you're probably going to miss your flight. And it's, you know, sorry. So they're sort of rushing through the airport as fast as they can. And they, uh, this is in Paris and they get to uh, the, you know, place and they get, grab a taxi and the taxi driver, despite their terrible rush, instead of, just getting them in the taxi, getting them wherever the heck they needed to be. Um, the taxi driver looks at Matthew Ricard, who's wearing these yellow monk's robes, and says, I don't remember the exact quote, but it was basically the effect of, why are you wearing that stupid dress? Oh. Right? <laughs> like, <laughs> why, why are you, you're a guy, why are you wearing a dress, that stupid dress, why are you wearing that? And if it were me, because I was under so much, it would have been under so much stress at the time. Yeah. I just would have like snapped at him, and, <laughs> yeah. you know, just like, what the hell, dude? Yeah. Yeah. Play to me. Yeah. Um, but Matthew, he was completely calm and he said, this, you know, this is my robe and it's actually very comfortable. Here, why don't you feel the fabric? And he walks over and he hands him the fabric and they start talking about the robe and how the robe is made and where it comes from and where it represents. And they have this very friendly conversation. The taxi driver starts smiling and they get in the taxi and they off they go. And it turns out they actually make the plane. Uh, there's a good happy ending to this. Yeah. But um, my, my friend asked him like, how did you do that? And he was like, well, you just, you know, at that moment, the important thing was just to have a good relationship with this taxi driver. It, you know, the plane wasn't the important thing. It was just, you know, to be, and that's an incredible example, I think, of being in the moment. You're not worried about the plane, even though the plane's only 10 minutes away and it's got, a, you know, you're not worried about the plane 10 minutes from now. Right. You're just <laughs> worried about, or you're not worried about anything. You just at that moment and you're, creating good relationships yeah. with people around you through your own ability to control your emotional responses to things yeah, and, and sort of create a good relationship with these people. It was very impressive to me. There's a lot of stories, uh, you know, that uh, uh, of sort of people doing great deeds. But to me, the not screaming at the taxi driver is an <clears throat> act of heroism beyond my comprehension. <laughs> It's a good thing there was a Buddhist monk there for that, you know, yeah. to, to take yeah. it on the chin because, you know, that the taxi cab driver would have radiated that experience one way or another. And if it had been more like a Manhattan or a Brooklyn situation where there would have been a lot of yeah. expletives and perhaps a fist to the face, that would have radiated the taxi cab driver's right. uh, anecdotes going forward, whereas Matteo... Uh, will allow this taxi cab driver to tell very positive stories about the man right. in the funny robe, whom now he now has, because if Matteo... Well, his had, friend in the funny robe, right? His now, friend in the funny robe. And maybe right. the robe's not so much funny anymore, because then he sees other people, other... Right. And I guess he hasn't seen, hasn't been exposed to the East very much. So, you know, right. maybe he's a provincial man. and <laughs> He just doesn't have that exposure. Yeah. But yeah, Mateo's a, uh, and Daniel Ingram was the other guy that I've, he's yeah. online. It's controversial. There are people in the Buddhist community like, oh, you're not enlightened. You're not a Bodhisattva or whatever. But yeah, who, who the hell cares? But he's an interesting guy to listen to because he's like, listen, man, I still put my shoes on the same way. I still get pissed right. off. But but I, I believe him when he says that he's because I I meditated a bit in my life and it's actually down regulated my asshole tendencies to a degree um i'm not so reactive anymore whereas before i was a con confrontation guy i love to you know argue with people or yada yada and so i don't do that anymore because i'm like it's a complete waste of time and i so anyway i see where it's helped help myself and so for a man who's done probably 30 times more hours than i have i believe it and and actually i interviewed eric black uh mm -hmm. earlier this summer and he's uh part of a team uh, of filmmakers and I think it's called Umbrella Films as a company and they did a film release this summer uh, documentary called Consciousness I think and uh, Christoph Koch was in it uh, Matteo Ricard and they were interviewing them and they were basically talking about you know phenomenal consciousness and things like that it's a fascinating uh, short film uh, but yeah uh, Matteo's presence in the film is is pal 
palpable. It's just a nice presence. Right. And, and I'm inspired by a lot of folks. Like um, there's a guy whose book I just bought it. It's his bi autobiography, I believe, or maybe it's a biography of him. And it's um, uh, Thomas Merton, who was a Trappist yes. monk. He was a party boy at Oxford and then he settled down and became a Trappist monk. And then he became a non-dual kind of monk. And he was hanging out with the Dalai Lama back in the mid sixties. And so that story of, of transformative, uh, whatever you want to call it, behavior or phenomena uh, within a person is, is fascinating to me. Uh, I don't go for so much the, you know, the deep religious spiritual thing, but just the process uh, of how we change ourselves midstream yeah. uh, is fascinating. Um, so I, yeah, yeah. Been... I've also done mindfulness meditation for quite a few years and maybe like you on and off, right? I try and do it every day. I far from succeed, mm -hmm. um, but I've had recently a success that um, I am sharing with anyone who wants to hear, because it's actually a practical success in my life. Uh, back to the research on happiness. One of the best things you can do, if you want to increase your happiness, I really, if someone asked me like, what one thing would you change in America to like increase happiness? I mean, there's a lot of big problems in America, but if you just want to increase happiness, I would like have a magic wand and have everyone get enough sleep at night. Mm. That getting enough sleep has such a big effect on your mood the next day and your happiness. And it's it's something that's within all of our power to do for most of you, unless we maybe have little kids who cry at night, but for most of us, it's within our power. But it's also for a lot of people, especially as you get a little bit older, your body starts producing less of the uh, chemicals in your brain that lead to sleep. It becomes harder to stay asleep and it becomes a little bit more challenging. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have tried for years various things to sort of help me go to sleep, including like trying to like meditate my way to sleep. And that's had no effect, no positive effect no. whatsoever. I just can't, can't do that. But what I decided a little while ago was that if I had not done my 20 minutes of meditation at some point during the day, if it got to that point and I was going to bed, I would just sit on the bed, not trying to go to sleep, but actually just trying to do my meditation. I do 20 minutes of meditation. And what I discovered is that when that happens, when I'm done with my 20 minutes of meditation, I fall asleep in minutes. It doesn't help. The meditation doesn't put me to sleep, but it clears out my mind. Mm -hmm. It sort of removes all the things that were keeping me awake. Okay. And then when I'm done, then I get under the covers and go to sleep. Um, but I can go to sleep right away. Um, so if you're dear listener, you know, interested in, in getting a better night's sleep and you you're, you're interested in this sort of meditation. Um, I really recommend giving that a try. And I do, it does take me, I don't know if it would work if my meditation was shorter. Um, so 20 minutes isn't long by Matthew Ricard standards, but it's twice what I started doing when I first was doing the meditation. So I think 20 minutes is a good, is a good space. Um, I'm a little, I'm a little weird. I do an hour uh, on Saturday night and an hour on Sunday night, but I really need to space it out. I need to have like a Wednesday, like 20 minute session and then maybe not quite an hour because what i found is on saturday night when i do it for an hour i can't sleep i i come out of a nice uh restful meditation i, I usually use music i don't i can't do silent meditations it's something i have to work on uh but i'll have i'll have uh, you mentioned in an interview like brian eno so i have like um drone or ambient uh, just to keep the monkey thing going somewhere else and then i can just sort of isolate from from chatter uh and then finally tamp down the chatter um but I find that if I do it on Saturday night before going to bed, uh, that it takes me longer to fall asleep by doing what I do, a long, deeper session where I actually do get into a very rested, uh, happy place uh, where there's not much thinking going on or anything like that. Yeah. So, so, but, but. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. Different, one hack, people, different effects. Yeah. 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 No, but I think if I, I've tried what you've talked about where I'm laying in bed and I can't sleep. And so I do what you described and it does work um, to, to do a body uh, awareness uh, mm -hmm. thing or counting like you, you know, and, and another thing that I do that's, that's again, very esoteric is uh, I do projects in my mind to get me to go to sleep. So I'll build oh. a greenhouse or I will take an acre of land and plan out 
because I love horticulture and botany. Mm -hmm. I mean that I I have this my I'm a plant hoarder in my own little yard in my suburban yard. <laughs> but but so I'll think about planting um sustain a sustainable like acre of land where I could feed myself kind of thing. And and so plotting out like what fruit trees would I put in and and uh, you know do I leave space for gardens and do I do raised beds and do I do aeroponics? And so if I give my brain that chore to do or to build a greenhouse or like the other day I built a dog. I had a dog back in the early eighties when I was a teenager and we lived in Virginia and it got cold in the winter. So I was like rethinking because when I was 13 or 14 with this dog, I built a thermally insulated dog house for this guy. <laughs> you know, but I had the dog house built and then I insulated it. And of course the dog would rip the insulation out. I put it back in, but eventually we worked it out where he stopped ripping it out. But, but I went back to that moment where the 13 year old in me was thinking, how do I apply insulation to the top of the structure and put a door on it and then build maybe an overstructure to it mm -hmm. uh, to uh, act as a weather shield like rain and so forth. So I just went through that routine in my head and it just put me, it usually puts me to sleep. So I, I, I don't know if that would help people too, but I highly recommend what you said, Aaron, to, to, if you can't sleep, to have a meditation routine that works for you. Again, body part awareness, proprioception, counting, um, what, what is it that, I don't know, some of the other quiet meditations that you do, right. but things like that, absolutely, absolutely. And if not, build a doghouse in your <laughs> in right. pots, like, build a weatherproof doghouse. Mm -hmm. Cause I was so proud of myself at 13, you know, I, I got, it wasn't fiberglass insulation, but I took old uh, quilts and blankets from thrift stores and I just stapled layers and layers of this down. And then I put a, a bed in for them. And then I put a door on there cause it would get cold in Virginia in the wintertime. And of course, being a young dog, you just shredded everything. So I did it over and finally he stopped shredding it. I think maybe appeased him with other things to chew on or whatever. So anyway, uh, but that just recycling that thought in my head uh, was able to just get me to just kind of let go of whatever else it was I was <laughs> thinking about because I do have kind of an ADD mind. So yeah. um, now we've, we've been at it for about an hour and a half. And so um, if you're, if you think you're, we're at a good place, we could call this part one and uh, bring you, we could bring you back. I could, um, get a copy of your book and we could talk about that and also just keep kind of going on some ideas and thoughts. But um, I, because I do have other questions for you. I'd like to, cause I know you, uh, you teach marketing and so marketing and object love. I mean, we didn't even get into that uh, arena yeah. and that, that may be a whole nother conversation right there, but I want to check in with you. If you, uh, we yeah. can go, we can go more or we can hit, we can hit pause here and then pick up. Let, let, I'm going to have to hit pause here. Okay. But I'd be very happy if, um, especially if you, once you have a chance to read the book, yeah. to talk uh, more and talk about marketing, and uh, that would be great. Okay, let's do that because because I'm intrigued. After researching you, I, I by way of third party, I've heard the book about the book and and other people talking to you about it. So yeah, I'm very much interested in in getting a copy and and being familiar with it and reading it thoroughly, as I profess not to do earlier. Um, so yeah, let's do that because this was a fun conversation. It was, uh, uh, hopefully, uh, dynamic and expansive in a sense. And, and, yeah. but at the same time, it had a flow to it. So we'll see. And I thank the YouTube audience as you, I usually, usually keep eight to 10% out to an hour and a half and <laughs> big ups to you guys for, uh, for the ones that stick around and watch all the way to the end. I think that's great. Cause we live in such an ADD society and, you know, mm -hmm. or, or, or a society with like a three minute tolerance, you know, and that's yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. I, on my, I have another YouTube that's all horticulture and botany and I keep my videos under two minutes because I, for the first few years I was watching my analytics and people would only, if I did a five minute video, they'd watch a minute and a half, two, three minutes of it at the most, you know, depending on what the topic was. But when you're talking about plants and it's all kind of dry information about the plant, you know, you're not going to capture people for five minutes or eight minutes. So right. I, I have a rule with that. I did a five minute video yesterday, but it was a breeding project, hybridization of, of different. So I had to focus on multiple trees that I was hybridizing and stuff. So the, there's exceptions, but ordinarily I try to keep everything under two minutes because I just know uh, it's better for the, for the viewer. Uh, I think they, they'll come back for more if it's mm -hmm. easy to digest like that. So, but I think in these long form conversations that cover a lot of uh, interesting thing about things rather about, uh, you know, the phenomena of being human and, and, you know, how do we, how do we gravitate towards flourishing and, and well-being and, and uh, move beyond uh, existential crisis and things like that. I think those are worth an hour and a half of your time. That's what I, that's all I do. I don't watch TV anymore. I just listen to conversations like this and listen to people share ideas. So 
anyway, I very much appreciate your time and company, Aaron. Uh, it was a great conversation and I look for, I'm already looking forward to bringing you back. We'll give this one a few months to, to, uh, get out in the world and get some legs and, and, uh, have some time out, but yeah, we'll check back in. Maybe, uh, we'll get through the holidays maybe. And then we'll, uh, we'll look at, uh, having you back for another conversation. All right, Justin, my pleasure. It has been great. And, uh, Thanks for the opportunity. And yeah, absolutely. Really time. Absolutely. It was an opportunity for me as well. Now, I will say goodbye to you after we stop recording, but to the YouTube sure. audience, thank you all again so much for your presence. And I hope this was a, an enjoyable or pleasant conversation for you. And uh, have, a, have a beautiful day, everyone, and take care.